Welcome to the Millennium Counseling Center podcast, where hope is yours, it's time to soar. I'm your host, Oren Madison. It's time to rise above and celebrate healing, hope, and recovery with the Millennium Counseling Center team. Special thanks to Kaz Source, who helps us with the production of our podcast. If anybody needs any help or looking into podcasts, please reach out to Kaz Source at kazcontent.com. Sportsypreneur is a content platform, a collaborative team, and a marketing brand that is all about showcasing leaders and difference makers in and around the world of sports. While we create our own content, we also create content with you. This includes collaborative content and exclusive content for your brand. Think podcasts, blogs, social media, and overall content strategy. Our sports content marketing team is specifically niche for those in the sports industry. That includes sports businesses, athletes, managers, coaches, trainers, entrepreneurs, and business leaders in the sports market. The bottom line is we want to help with your sports-related brand, your content marketing, and your story. Connect with us on Instagram at sportsepreneur or find us online at sportsepreneur.com. Sportsepreneur, the content platform where sports and entrepreneurship collide. People always ask, which do you miss most, uh, NFL or college? And it's it's an easy decision for me. It's college. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. College football. Just again, the camaraderie, the spirit, all of the above. There's something yeah. about it. It's amateur sports in a sense. Uh, yeah. Now, obviously, with nil being in the play, it's going oh, to get interesting. Yeah. It's going to get yeah. interesting. It's very, we've already seen it, right? I mean, it's just crazy what's going on. I think like that nil and the transfer portal yeah. is just, yeah. the game is completely different now. Yeah. What do you think about like the transfer portal? I mean, you see guys just left and right. I mean, it's thousands. I heard there's a big number. It's not just football either, right? It's across the all sports, like 10,000 or something. Yeah. I'll be honest. I'm not a fan of it. Yeah. You know, I get it. You know, it's case by case. I understand if, if maybe your coach leaves or, or all of the above. But for me, I'm just more old school. Again, I'm not old, but I'm more right. old school, uh, traditional if there's something you're complaining about in regards to a sport or, or if you're following the depth chart, work harder, figure out a way as opposed to just leaving. Because I think in most cases, you're going to run into the same problem <laughs> at another spot, especially if you're not performing as well as you should be. Right. 100%. Well, don't you see it there? You probably see it with like couples, like relationships. When a couple gets divorced, a lot of times they bring those same issues with them to the second and the third marriage, right? It's like, exactly. if you don't fix yourself first, it's that stuff <laughs> just going to be there. <laughs> exactly. Absolutely. And you see it with people with substance abuse as well. They'll move, they'll change jobs, like their life is all jacked up. And so then they get a new job and then they get a new wife and then they get a new house. And guess what? You're still an alcoholic, even if you have exactly. a new wife, a new job and a new house. And I think that people try to look for solutions. Like you said, Monte, the solution is working harder and playing better. But that's the hardest solution. Wait a minute, I got to work harder and play better? That seems kind of hard. So maybe I'll just transfer to a different school where uh, you know, they'll, they'll think I'm better than I am. So I agree with you. I think it's, uh, you know, like I said, I agree with Monte. I think that sometimes it's warranted. I think like if you're really close to a coach and he recruits you and then they leave or something like that. I mean, if you make a decision based on who you think you're going to play for, which a lot of people do, then I can understand why that would be disappointing and want to look at something else. But hopefully your decision isn't that strongly based on the individual coach anyway. So Exactly. Very true. Don't you see like third-year players, fourth-year players who were like, man, they thought they would come in as their freshman year and they would be the guy. Mm-hmm. And then they didn't, but they worked hard. They did all these things. And by the time they're a junior or senior, or even fifth-year senior, all of a sudden they pop. You're like, what happened? Well, man, behind the scenes, you didn't see what they were doing. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Well, even look at Hutchinson from Michigan, right? He was a good player last year. He was coming out. He would have been probably a low first round pick. And then he comes back. He could have gone to the NFL last year. And then now he'll be the one or two pick, right? Yep. So, yeah. And you see it in hoops all the time, right? Guys stick around for a couple extra years. They could have gone. And even like a Franz Wagner or somebody like that, they come back. and Guys peak at different times and, and hit their you know stride. What? Yeah. Yeah. Do you know what? <laughs> I heard you, you've been on a few podcasts and you were talking about how when you were in Wisconsin, like it didn't matter what was going on. Like you just go out there and dominate. Like you felt it, right? Like you just show up and practice whatever, whatever. Cause you see it, right? You see it in big state schools, right? The party scene's just off the charts. Oh gosh. Right. And you just show up and be that good, like to be that good, right? Like that's just different. And you just yeah. didn't wreck it. Like it just didn't matter. Oh, it did early on. 
that's why I'm not so much a fan of the transfer portal, just because my own lived experience. So if you go back and check out my career, I barely played my freshman year in 2009 and barely played the first half of the 2010 season. But we then go and play Iowa at Kinnick Stadium. And I was behind John Clay and James White. I was third string. And both of them got injured that game. And so I had to step up and I made the fourth down catch to save the drive, right? There's one minute left to go in the game. And then I scored the game winning touchdown. And at that moment, I never gave the position back. But prior to that moment, yeah, I was thinking about maybe transitioning to like linebacker position, doing something just to get on the field. But what I did do was put my head down, grind, work. And when the opportunity presented itself, I capitalized on it. And so for me, my freshman year in that first half of my sophomore year, I was experimenting a little bit with the party scene, FOMO, all that stuff. And then I got really serious. And then also I just got really serious and understood what I needed to take care of. But then also what happened is I started to develop a even stronger relationship with alcohol throughout this transitioning process of becoming the starter, now living my life in a fishbowl on the sense on campus, social anxiety, and depression, all of that stuff. So it's kind of weird how it all came about. But again, all in all, again, back to the transfer portal. I'm just, I don't like it. I don't like it. And again, as we already talked about, case by case, it's different. But I just feel like, okay, if we do have this transfer portal, you should be able to transfer just one time. I don't even know if they have a cap on it or what, or I don't know. I think it's considered a one time. Is it a one time? Okay. I think it is. One time without sitting out. Without sitting out, as many yes. Times as you want, but the first time you don't have to sit out, but you can keep transferring. I mean, there's a couple of those guys, they're on their 14th. Right. But yeah. then when you transfer, you have to, they're in like their seventh year. Well, they just said and Caleb then, Williams <laughs> is transferring, but he's just basically yeah, testing totally. the market. Like it, yeah. that's just a true free agent, right? You see that right. in the NBA. Yeah. <laughs> it's no longer an amateur sport anymore. And again, I'm in favor of the players. I'm in favor of nil, but I think nil plus the transfer portal. It's dangerous. Cause you go to the program and I did not play a sport like that. Right. But you develop these connections and you develop your people around you, like those relationships that you have. And when you cut that off, you're gone. Like they don't have the time then for the player that's not there. And if you're at Wisconsin and now you're at LSU, I mean, you're gone. And obviously there's new people there waiting for you, but those connections take a while to develop, right? Especially if you're transferring after your freshman or sophomore year. I mean, you just got there. Yeah. And that's the thing too, right? These folks who are transferring after their freshman year, it's like, you got to stick it out. You you never know what's going to happen. There's no way me going, we just beat the number one team in the country, Ohio State, in 2010 in Camp Randall Stadium. And I didn't play a single snap the following week, right? I'm still third in the depth chart. Yeah. All of a sudden, I get my turn to play. And then from there on, I start. So it's like these players have to understand, like certain circumstances most likely are going to happen that may provide you that opportunity to capitalize on it. But obviously, if you're jumping ship early, it's, again... I understand it to each their own, but that is my opinion. Man, there's a lot of stuff. <laughs> there's a lot to take on with college sports and everyone's got opinions with it right, right. now. No different right. than, you know, when I had reached out to you, Derek, this week, I mean, obviously the news is just popping off everywhere. And I sent you a text before we get on here from a tweet in regards to Antonio Brown, right? So uh-huh. it's like everybody's out there talking about it. And I was like, well, what if you and Monte just had a conversation about this and, and I could be here and just kind of continuing the conversation because like I said, everyone has an opinion. Right. And at first it's like, are people laughing at it? What's going on? Is there something serious? Like, it's just there's so much. You know, Terry Bradshaw gets on there and you're hearing him talk about it and you're like, oh wow, he's saying things. It's like we need professionals out there. You need like Derek to get on and have a conversation with whoever. Like, don't have that conversation unless you have a professional nearby because it's there's so much to it. There's so many layers to unpack and where do you even start with that kind of conversation? And there's someone else, Derek, who I've introduced you to before, Lisa Bontasumi. And I asked her, with all the doctors in the NFL, with all the doctors for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, and I don't know this, right? I'm just, the question that came to my mind is, why is he on the field at that point? Like, should he not have been playing at that point? Or was there more to it? Or now you're hearing the stories about the coach and wanting him to go in, but he was hurt and he didn't want to go in. I don't know what's true and what's not true, but... Should there have been a situation where the NFL should say, maybe he shouldn't be playing? I don't know where to take that. But Are you saying physically or mentally he shouldn't have been on the field? 
I wouldn't think mentally, but both, right? Yeah. Like, I mean, here's the thing. I think that, Monte, you can talk better about this in the NFL, but here's what I see is so many people try to treat this with doctors, right? They try to treat mental health in the same way as you treat, you know, I had a guy high up at Northwestern. He came to me and he said, hey, we figured out addiction. And I was like, oh, Jesus, I can't wait to hear what he says about this. <laughs> and uh, he was talking about there's medications, naltrexone and Vivitrol, that in theory decrease cravings for opiates and for alcohol and things like that. And they work, right? They're good. But the issue is not like, there's not going to be a medical breakthrough that's going to solve mental health or addiction. There's going to be things that can help it. You know, you can have antidepressants. Those will help. You can medicate bipolar. You can medicate schizophrenia, things like that. But when you're talking about depression, anxiety, and things like that, these are all helpers. Those aren't solutions. They're things that are going to make it better. But just taking a pill is not going to fix everything. And I think that's probably, my guess is, is what happened with Brown is, is that you had medical doctors who were used to treating medical problems, looking at things, and that's how they treated it. So I'm not sure that you're going to get to the right solution. But like I said, Monte, you probably know better in the NFL, but that's what it seems like to me. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I know for a fact, obviously, we all know teams have physicians, multiple physicians, even so for certain positions. And in my honest opinion, we've been seeing hating red flags, but for lack of a better word, right? We, we've been seeing signs, symptoms, very strong symptoms of poor mental health with Antonio Brown for the last three to four years. Uh, significant signs, actually. Even off the field, there were circulating videos from his Snapchat or something of his three or four-year-old child standing in the back seat while he was driving like 50, 60 miles down the road, and this child is dancing in the back seat. So that, in my opinion, shows that he's not only just doing this in his football pads, the decline of his mental health is impacting his life outside of his job. And so for me, I think when we talk about these team physicians, when we talk about what are they trying to accomplish, Derek, this is the conversation we have all the time is performance based. These team physicians meet with the owners. These team physicians meet with the head coach, meet with the presidents of these teams, of these football clubs. And the main objective is how soon can he get back out on the field? That's what it is. Yes, we're going to talk about his mental health. How is he doing? We're going to check all the boxes that we need to check just to make sure we check these boxes, dot our I's and cross our T's. But is he going to be able to play this week? How soon can he be out there? That is what the team's physicians focus on. That is their job. How fast can you get them on the field? And as we see with Antonio Brown, there should have been, and maybe there has been, who knows, we're on the outside looking in, but there should have been very lengthy and thorough conversations between him, team physicians or psychologists, psychiatric care, what have you, obviously regarding his mental health because the symptoms are there. I'm not a doctor, but if you ask me to guess, it seems like he's bipolar for sure at the minimum. Do you think something like this then pushes that in either one of you? to get to that point to where there are different doctors? Because that's interesting, like how you say it's all performance-based. And Derek, we had a conversation some months ago and so much of what's being talked about is performance-based that's out there and how it's not about taking your from 96 to 99 or 100%, right? There's more to this, right? This is about bettering the individual or helping the individual out. Do you think an episode, I don't even know what the right word is and you can tell me like a situation like this calls for attention to say, we have to change the protocol for that player being on the field. I think that any major university pro sports team, almost all of them employ sports psychologists. And so they think that this all falls under sports psychologists. And I think that's the mistake that people make. And it goes back to the performance issue is that they think they have it covered because they have a sport. Now, but look, there's some sports psychologists who are definitely in tune with the, the true mental health of things and not just focus on performance, but in general, you're talking about two different things when you're talking about the Tamante's point. In some cases, the focus is on the performance and the issue here is not on the performance and hasn't been in many cases with these players. The issue here is with the general mental health, the general well-being. It wouldn't matter if he was on the football field or if he was working at the Walmart, right? Whatever he's going through, he's going through and it's going to affect his life. And I can't guess what's behind the scenes there with a player like that, but I will say that you hear a lot of criticism, you hear a lot of judgment, you hear a lot of people with really strong opinion, but I think that I'm always hesitant to have too much of an opinion before I really know what's going on because you take somebody who has performed at as high of a level as he has, and, and think about this, 
think about how hard he worked to get back into the NFL, right? He jumped through all sorts of hoops. He did all sorts of suspensions. He did all sorts of clauses and contracts and everything like that. I mean, he went through a lot to play again, right? It wasn't like people were just signing him right back up. He had to go through a lot. Even, and he just was coming off a suspension anyway. So he went through all this stuff to get back on the field. And then he just blows up his entire career because of a bad choice. I don't think it's a bad choice, right? I don't think that's a, based on a bad decision. I think it's, it's deeper than that. And it's more serious than that, really. I think if somebody, because he has to know when he's walking off the field, this is it, right? I mean, who knows what will happen in the future, but it's for sure it with the Bucks. And I don't know. I don't know what your take is on that, my day, but that's how I see it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I really like what you said. And, you know, that's kind of what Tom Brady said as well. People got to be a little bit more compassionate, a little bit more empathetic with what he's dealing with. And I sometimes have to check myself as well, too. You know, I'm no doctor. I should not throw out what I think he may be struggling with. I'm on the outside looking in. But I, I do think there's more. There's most definitely more to it. My opinion is just, I'm always going to think this. I feel like more could have been done because, yeah, performing at an extremely high level, we have to make sure that we're also paying attention to these athletes' mental health. And fortunately, maybe something like this has to happen for these football clubs to really be like, okay, uh-huh. you know, we've been hearing this for the last four years now. Maybe we really need to start allocating some funds towards our mental health departments or even creating a mental health department in these football clubs because when these players start playing extremely well, devoting so much time in their actual bodies to the sport, to these football clubs, while also knowing that a lot of these positions, these players are walking on eggshells, right? These trade deadlines, you got players coming in, running back players were coming in on Tuesdays and trying out for the Broncos, and we knew that every single week. You got to make sure that these players are doing okay in between their ears. And and for me, just for the amount of money that the NFL makes as these football clubs make, what are you talking about? A hundred and fifty thousand dollars salary for a psychologist or two? Who knows? I get a little frustrated with it because I was somebody who struggled with alcoholism. I'll forever be a recovering alcoholic, but the decision they made was to get rid of me instead of to try to help me. Yeah. Again, I don't want to make it about myself, but I'm not the only one who's dealt with something like this. Weren't there signs like with COVID, right? In the last, you have Calvin Ridley, who stops playing football. You go to the Olympics, you go to other players, you go to the NBA. There's players, college sports, right? You see players who are taking a break for their mental health. The NFL sees it, right? And we talked to someone recently on a podcast and hasn't published that and we'll get it out there soon. And she was a part of the NFL PA and she's doing everything, I think, in her power to help out, right? But it's bigger than that, right? Because there's so many layers and above where she is. And if that's on the PA side, so it's the actual, the shield, right? As they call it, like, what are they doing? Like you said, 150,000, whatever it is, a million dollars, like it's a drop in the bucket. And there are signs out there, not for just Antonio Brown, which there are there, but for other players. And they're basically screaming out, like there's clearly something going on. And the pressures, like you said, I was telling someone this, like field goal kickers, you hear about it. Like the amount of pressure they're on just to put that thing through those uprights. Like for them, maybe that's all they do. But imagine showing up to practice and you miss two field goals. And then you look over on the other side and you can tell us this, that there's another kicker that they brought in who you probably even know that guy and they're trying him out. That just is a sign whether it's true or not, they might cut you. Like, and you might have a family, you have bills to pay, you have things, you're like... And if you get cut, then what? Like, I'm sure then all of a sudden you start thinking ahead and you got this anxiety about what's to come. Am I ever going to play football again? What am I going to do with my life? Like, I can't even imagine the pressures that exist for, for that athlete. Like you're talking about, they're trying out running backs like right next to you. And you're like, this could be it. Yeah. And I mean, just like you said, you have family. And at first, obviously, players understand that to, yeah. to a certain extent what yep. they're signing up for. Right. Comes with the territory type of thing, right? Ex- yeah, exactly. Exactly. But just like you said, with families, right? You have a child who's seven or eight years old in school. <laughs> and now you, you go from San Francisco, you go from the 49ers to Boston, right? Uh, yeah. and you're, you're playing for the Patriots out there in a week. So these are the type of pressures that a lot of folks don't really put into consideration when we talk about the stressors that come along with playing on a big stage. But for me, again, it comes down to the shield. It comes down to why don't we just raise the salary cap, right? And the amount that you raised it, like if you say, okay, now each football club has an additional $2 million, those $2 million have to be allocated strictly for mental health services, mental health department, what have you. Who's going to complain about that? 
<laughs> yeah. Uh, who's going to complain about that? It's, I don't understand why that is not something that we're not doing, but I love the fact that we have Naomi Osaka, somebody at that stage, obviously a different sport, but it's just a woman just crushing it in tennis, speaking out about it. Obviously, we had Kevin Love in basketball, Calvin Ridley, of course, football, many other football players, uh, Darren Waller talking about his uh, being a recovering alcoholic for the Raiders, all of the above. This stuff needs to continuously happen just so Goodell and the rest of the guys up there and women can be like, okay. I think it's time for us to really do something. Yeah, and I think we're close. I think we're right on the edge of this. I really do. I think that there's always been this idea that that athletes are superheroes and they just work hard to run faster, be better, and everything will be all right. And, you know, as a society, we look up to people who do well at things, whether it's people who do well in their careers or, or people who are good athletes. You know, there's all sorts of masses who kind of look at a guy like you, Monte, and say, oh, that, like, that must be the life, right? I got to be like that guy. And then with that comes this idea that you're infallible, right? That there are no cracks in the armor. And at the end of the day, we're all just human beings. And with the added pressure of, like you said, of knowing that you could get cut tomorrow and things, you know, in many ways, athletes have much more stressful lives. You know, I think you see the nice lifestyles and, the, and money and it, you're getting paid to play a sport. I think it looks easy from the outside, but at the end of the day, right? It's not an easy road and it's a lot of work and it's a lot of pressure. And I'm hopeful that there's people who are starting to recognize this, who realize that this is necessary. And I see that with the feedback that we get on the work that we're doing with athletes. And when we talk to athletic directors and their feedback is really positive and they say, yeah, we need that. And yeah, we'll find the money and things like that. And, you know, it all boils down to, I hate to say it this way, but it has to hit. It has to hit where it hurts the most, right? And the Bucks go to the playoffs, don't have Antonio Brown. They're missing half their team already anyway. And they lose out in the first or second round because they don't have the players. Then that might change the way we treat athletes is, is when it really starts to hit these teams all the way up to the top, to the owners who are affected by this. Because right now they're not, right? Right now the people who are controlling those decisions, the people who are deciding whether they spend $100, $500 million on mental health for their team, they're not being affected by it because they're still putting out that the money's coming in, they're filling the stadiums. But I think that more and more of this, as this happens, it's becoming more frequent. You're reading about somebody every week, right? Who's sitting out because of mental health. And so I just think it's one of those things that's kind of like a hidden little dirty secret that nobody wanted to talk about. And now it's out there. And it's one of the things I think that COVID, there's silver linings to everything. I think COVID was brutal for mental health, but it may have pushed us in a direction where people are more willing to talk about it, get help and uh, including at the professional sports level. Yeah, it's very true. You had talked about more could be done and we were just touching on that. And you had the story where you, I don't know if it was after or at the beginning of a running backs meeting with the Broncos and your running backs coach. I think that was the story, right? And he had said he could spill alcohol on you. Was that a moment at that time? And I don't know this. Did that running backs coach, did that make a difference for you to get the help that you needed? Or was that the beginning of it? And I'm kind of alluded maybe a little bit to what's going on with other people. Because sometimes it takes one person to like point, whether it's a spouse, a coworker, a friend, somebody else that like calls something out that they're noticing, right? And I don't know if that could have happened with Antonio Brown. Like you see Mike Evans go over to him and that's in the moment. Like he's already gone to that place wherever he's going. So it might be too late. But you don't know if he's perhaps having conversations with him at dinner and talking to him about these things, but you see him try to help out, right? There was a moment there and he tried to help out. But anyway, kind of going back to your story in that situation with your coach, what transpired there and what did that all lead to? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. My running backs coach, real quick, I would think he could smell alcohol on me and pull me to the side after a meeting. And, and he did. He did ask me if I needed any help with it, but I said no, because I didn't feel as if I would be awarded the anonymity that I wanted, that being opening up to him about my drinking problem and hoping that he wouldn't share it with the coach. And then all of a sudden, I'm in the hot seat just because apparently I'm not taking care of what I need to take care of off the field. And I want to say this as well, right? I get it, right? I was 24 years old. I'm a man. I'm capable of making my own decisions. But I just wish that looking back on it, ask me again, ask me again. Maybe pull me to the side again and ask me, but it was a kind of a one and done thing for me. And then when I was released by the Broncos, I want to share the person's name, but the person I had to speak with before I walked out uh, with my trash bag and my stuff in my trash bag shares that he knows that I like to hit the town pretty hard and party a lot. And I just need to gain my focus back. 
And I was just like, okay, that's fine. But long story short, I can only imagine what these conversations were like with other folks who were dealing with similar things. And it's, it needs to be more than just a one conversation. And if you don't correct it, you're getting released. That's not how it should be. It's a job. It's a job. We're unionized as well, the NFLPA. There just needs to be more done for the sake of the players in the moment when they are struggling with their mental health. Yeah. Well, you hear about that fear, right? When it was a sexual assault case for like the women's soccer team, they're afraid to say something because they might not start. They might not travel with the team. The power is the Kyle Beach story, right? That power, their whole future, their whole livelihood was based around playing on the Chicago Blackhawks or whatever that was going to be. And if they out this person, they could be done forever. Because there's so much power behind it, right? At these organizations. Because, you know, I've heard of stories of like the compliance office at a large institution at a college. Like if they get a hold of something, they have no relationship with you, perhaps, or probably not. But they're trying to protect their brand and their institution and all these things. And if it gets out, like cut him, get rid of him. He's out of the school, take away his scholarship, right? And so like the fear that you must have, like you couldn't even, we couldn't even put ourselves into that situation of what that would be like to hold on to that, to know that you can't say anything because if you do, you could be done. Right, exactly. That's what it is. I know that's what it is. Most players just don't want to talk about it, don't want to reach out and speak about it because then it's like, and now did I flag myself? Right now, if I fumble in practice, are they going to think, oh, he was out drinking? If I make a mistake, oh, was he out drinking? Is that always going to be the tagline now or the saying whenever I do something? You know, we all make mistakes in practice, right? It's practice. Or if I made a mistake in a game. So there are a lot of politics in sports, unfortunately. And that should not come into play when we're talking about a player's mental health. And as Derek and I have talked about now countless amounts of times, where we talk about performance-based psychiatric care, which essentially what psychologists are doing for the players and the team physicians are doing for the players now, it's not beneficial to the athlete. It's only beneficial to the owner, the coaches. Granted, yes, a byproduct of playing well, you get paid, you get endorsements and stuff, but essentially, if you don't take care of it, it's going to catch up to you. Yeah. Yeah, I think my hope is is that we get to a point where we can, you know, I think this is far off, but even if we can get to the point where we treat the mental health the same way we treat the physical health, right? You see teams, they'll stick by a guy for two years. If they think that the guy's going to come back and be a performer for them, right? They'll pay for surgeries and rehabs and keep paying salaries and things like that. And if they're important enough to the team, they'll let them roll through, right? And they'll give them as much support. I mean, I remember when Jake Butt got hurt, right? When he was, you know, before he went to the NFL and he was still, still rehabbing like two years later. I think he's out of the NFL now, but he was like still trying to hold on and they were still covering all that stuff. And I think that there's just, that's why Monte, I love what you're doing because you're an advocate and somebody who's trying to break down the stigma of this. And so for somebody who's been there and done that and had the success that you did to come out and talk about this, I mean, this is exactly what we need because as soon as we stop being afraid to talk about it, and as soon as we stop treating it like it's some little dark secret and that it's the reality of that, you know, you got a team of 60, 70 guys, you know, realistically, you probably got six or seven addicts or alcoholics on your team. You probably have seven or eight or 10 or 12 guys with pretty significant mental health issues, right? You've got another God knows how many people with trauma issues. So we can all pretend like it doesn't exist. But at the end of the day, all we're doing is just wanting to turn the other way and not look at it. And so the more people we have like you, and I know you've dedicated your life to this now, you've dedicated your life to spreading the word and advocating for it and, and trying to tear down the stigma on this stuff. But like you said, any time one of these situations, I mean, look at all the conversation around Antonio Brown. Look at all the people that are talking about mental health now. And some people are skirting it and some people are going straight after it. But at the end of the day, I'm sorry that that had to happen to him. And I am genuinely concerned about his well-being. But at the end of the day, something like that might be just enough to keep pushing us in the right direction and allow people to really take an honest look at this and really try to see how do we actually treat this not just make it look like we care, like not just make it look like we're treating it, but actually try to treat it and find a solution for these folks, right? Absolutely. I appreciate that, Derek. And that's why I'm so passionate about this, because I think at the current moment, we're seeing a majority of folks are making fun of Antonio Brown. And for me, I get very passionate about what I do now, because we've been witnessing the symptoms for the last three to four years. And then he has a, a blow up moment. 
and then you write them off. Yeah. That's just not the world that I want to live in. It's not the people I want to be around me. And that's just what we need to correct. And again, everybody's entitled to their own opinions. You can't change that. But I think when we talk about the, the bigger picture, these institutions, that the shield, like the biggest stage ever, really, it's like they have the capabilities. They have the opportunity right now to step out in front of this and be the leaders in something like this where all fans will get behind it all of the above to where we can really chart down a path that's better for all involved. Yeah. This might be another conversation, but I think it's related. And since you were in the NFL, like you have former players in the NFL, especially when you have players from like the early days, the 70s, mm. the 80s, oh, right? Boy. In the CT, in the stuff. And I've talked to some players and like you said, the amount of money that the league makes and what goes to the players that made the league what it is today and what they're going through, right? Like you've heard the stories, like forget water, if your bell's wrong, right? Like you get back in the game, like who knows? What do former players, I guess there's so many parts to this question or just this thought, like I said, it's probably a whole nother conversation. We can definitely have it. What do other players, former players, what are they saying about, what are you hearing in regards to the situation in regards to Antonio Brown? Is it the similar type message that you're talking about? Is it a mixed bag? Like you said, there are. You get on Twitter. Just go spend two minutes on Twitter. You'll see it's that lasting image with him with his shirt off in the end zone, like cheering him. And you you see a ton of that stuff. But like, what are you hearing right now out there? Absolutely. Yeah. Some former players, you know, obviously they're still a little upset. Players in the 60s and 70s, right? Because of the new CBA, they kind of didn't get what they were advocating for, which is life insurance, all of the above. And that, again, as we all know, that's another conversation about you got to be the best player. You got to jump through all these hoops to really get life insurance, which is purposely structured that way. Or excuse me, not life insurance, excuse me, health insurance. But when it comes with former players, you, you get more empathy from them. You most definitely do. Way more compassion because they understand. They get it. They understand some of the aches and pains that you have physically and also mentally that you have to deal with, that you have to manage, at least try to. But with the lack of, again, this is what I literally had a conversation with a person about three weeks ago about this. And they said, with just the lack of focus surrounding the care for NFL athletes, current and former, is not being talked about. And we can all see, we all understood what happened with the whole concussion thing. Once CTE really came about and Goodell and the rest of them, this is public, but doing the best that they can to sweep it under the rug until it literally turned into a mountain that molehill and so that's one facet of this or one component of this wheel house and i think what these former athletes they just understand that if we all don't continuously talk about it and band together nothing's going to change unfortunately because it's like what derek stated the owners are not being impacted yet they're not they're still making the monies they're still filling seats merchandise is still selling and tv networks are still uh, bidding and so until we I guess, figure out a way to hit their pockets. Yeah. And talent just keeps coming into the league, right? Of course. The talent that you're seeing now, like there's wide receivers all over college that these kids are ready to go. Oh, yeah. And they can make those. I mean, and he is like, you're talking about Derek. I mean, Antonio Brown's playing and he came in there. He was the third receiver to start. And then he's like, he's one of the best receivers in the league again. Like, it's incredible what he did. If you just think about how good he is at the job that he's to do. But there's more talent, like you said. So okay, they want to keep him as long as possible, utilize his talent, but there's other guys ready to come in and take someone's job, as you know, immediately. They don't care, right? They'll find someone. And that's the thing is being on the outside looking and we don't, I understand at a certain point, right? If you are truly trying everything you can to get this player to help out as much as you can and he does have a blow up like that and all the time, obviously you will have to make a decision, but just going out on the limb here, you know, from my experience and what players have been sharing with me now, not much has really changed from my experience. I guarantee you, again, the conversations that he most likely had behind closed doors regarding his health has been, how is your physical health? Can you play? And, and that's been the focus, focal point of, I'm sure, all of those conversations, yeah. Well, and I think you hear words a lot when you're talking about college athletics, you know, pro sports, whatever. High school club, but you hear a lot of words like family and 
people talking about, I care about you, right? We genuinely care about you. Listen, And then you talk to athletes and Monte, I'm sure you felt this, you're saying, but you're a commodity, right? You are something that is valuable to other people. And so then they treat that with value. But when you're talking about family, we don't care about our sister because somehow they add value. They don't add value to the family because of their skill sets, right? You care about your sister because she's your sister and she's family. And so if she's in trouble, you take care of her and you help make sure she's okay. And I think that that's the thing is, is that I think if we can, even if we can just move to a place where people actually follow through with what they say that is going on in these environments, then we'll be okay. And I think that to your point, I think there's plenty of people who genuinely care. I think there's coaches and athletic directors and like Tom Brady, what he said, I agree. I think, I think he's probably genuinely concerned about it and teammates and maybe Arians is too, right? I don't know. But I think that at the end of the day, like, it's just that if we're going to kind of promote these environments as being caring, supportive places, then we need to do it across the board and we need to give them the resources to be able to address these things instead of just looking at it like they messed up, right? Like they messed up. I mean, look, I said this earlier, but with Antonio Brown, this isn't based on a bad choice by him. This isn't because he made a bad decision. Something's going on there. There's something else going on that would lead him to act the way that he did beyond just being too angry or being too whatever. I mean, that's people have said. They've never seen that during a game, right? It's bizarre. When you start using words like that, then there's probably something deeper than just poor choices, right? When you start seeing things you've never seen and people are saying, that's bizarre, that's crazy. I've never seen anything like this, right? When you're getting that, the reason why it's so shocking is because we've all seen plenty of people make bad choices. We know what that looks like. But what he did wasn't, in my opinion, wasn't about bad choices. This is about something additional. And again, I don't know what it is, but I guess it is that it's mentally health related. It would be my best guess. And I think that we have to just be a little bit more compassionate towards these things. And, you know, I think it makes people feel better to criticize somebody who's famous and rich and all these things. So, you know, then it kind of brings them down to the regular people's level. But I think that one of the problems overall in society is we don't have enough compassion. So let's start with the things we care about. Let's have compassion for these other human beings and athletes and people we watch every Sunday and start there. And I think we'll, we'll move in the right direction. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, it'd be like, it's a whole thing about worry about yourself, like worry about your own front porch as opposed to criticizing everyone else that's out there. And it's like you said, it's so easy to get on Twitter because like everyone could be like, well, he should have done this. He should have done that. Or who like whether it's a player, why'd he throw that interception? Like you don't realize how complicated that is and what all is going on there. <laughs> There's so much to it. There's one thing I will say that that athletes do have and they have the platform. And what you're doing, Monte, is you, you are utilizing a platform, right? It's maybe not while you're playing. And I know things change, like you talked about before. They will discard you very quickly. And I've heard this before. There's a, one of the leading tacklers, or I think the leading tackler in West Virginia football history said he could get a call, a meeting, anything with anybody while he was at West Virginia. The second he left, he said the cool factor wore off real quick. He's like, no one would return his phone call. And that was very humbling for him. And he went through a whole experience of many years of trying to deal with that and tried to come out from that. But he's got a platform now, just like you do. And, and players, while they're playing, as we've seen in many different scenarios, whether it's political or social or who knows, they do have a platform. So there are stances to take because I would imagine if enough players got together, there is something they could do. Like, we're not going to stand for this anymore. No one's listening to us. Antonio Brown, like whatever he went through, like he's a part of us. He's a part of the family. And we can't let these things happen because it, you know, paints a bad picture for everybody. And, you know, I don't know what that means and if that will do something. But to your point, Derek, like I think players have an ability at some point, which is also at the same time, I'm just sitting here talking about like there's a ton of risk involved with that. It's like if you don't have enough of them, they'll discard those players and they'll find someone else to play. So it's not without a ton of risk. I don't know what that looks like. But if there's players that, that are more outspoken, is that something that perhaps could happen at some point? I don't know. Yeah, I, absolutely. You're 100% right. I mean, it's one of those things where we can't expect for the owners to band together and just say, okay, all right, all right, we're going to do this. Some of the greatest changes in American history came about because it came about from the bottom to the top, you know, bottom up, you know, the civil rights movement, millions of African-Americans coming together saying, you know what, we're going to chart this path and make them make a decision for us. Again, I'm not equating this to that, exactly that situation, but just from the people at the bottom, the players, we don't 
we weren't making nowhere near as much money as, as the owners, the presidents, et cetera, are making. But if they band together and don't expect for the owners to make the change, them to make the change, or force the owners to make the change, I think, yeah, that's a great place to start. And so I honestly believe, yeah, the more players who speak out, the Naomi Osaka's, the Kevin Loves, and myself, I mean, there's hundreds of others continuously doing this. I think it's going to work out. It is. It's most likely going to work out. Yeah. I appreciate you guys talking about this. I don't know if you, either of you have anything else to add on this topic or more, but man, this is it's important. And I think it's the dialogue, right? It's the conversations. Like to your point, Derek, this isn't like, oh, let's have a conversation. Let's go figure this thing out. And there it is. Like this is very complicated. And maybe that's an easy way out word. I don't know, but there's a lot of layers to this. And this is what you do, like a little bit. So like I talk about like on a podcast, it's just one conversation at a time. If I'm sitting here worried about who's going to listen to it or the type of people I'm going to meet, the type of business I'm going to forget all that. Man, I just got a chance to talk to Mane Ball. Do you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> and to hear your story and to learn from you. I got kids. I mean, I got a son and he's in high school and I hear the things that they're going through. Oh, yeah. And I've shared this with Derek and I can tell stories and we had never even talked before. And I promise you, I've shared stories of the things that you've talked about, whether it's with Derek or what I heard on your podcast or what you've talked about on other people's podcasts, that's real, man. Like it's making an impact. Even if it's just one family in Charlotte, North Carolina, like that's having an impact on like what you're doing. It matters. And I think these conversations have a way of mattering, even if it's just for the three of us, if nothing else, or maybe just for me, I don't know, right. but like uh -huh. it's worthwhile, <laughs> man. So I, I appreciate your time. No, man, thank you. It's passion, man. I, I get it happy-go-lucky kid my entire life and then all of a sudden boom up oh, here's alcoholism for you and it's just life right we all deal with life all three of us right here deal with circumstances that come about out of nowhere that you now have to deal with and just like what derek always talks about which i think is the literally the most important piece i think as to why all this is what it is is athletes are not viewed as human beings they're not viewed as like thy neighbor they're viewed as these just impenetrable gods that just have nothing wrong with them or they don't deal with life like we do they don't have stressors like we do and all that stuff and i think that's why we are where we are right now or why athletes are viewed as these perfect beings yeah i'll tell you one thing that encourages me is if you talk i coach high school soccer still i talk to these kids if you talk to a 15 16 17 year old they are so educated about mental health at this point they understand what the words are. They understand what those mean. They freely talk about it. And even with the colleges that we, you know, the amazing thing is that with the colleges that we work with, when we work with college athletes, the main way they know about us is from their teammates. The main reason they know there's help available is from their teammates. So I think that generationally, and okay, we're in a, I'm in a different generation than you, but I think that as we get younger, it's becoming better. I think it's getting better. And I hope that we continue along that path but I agree with Eric. I think people like you coming out and talking about this, and it's why, you know, as I've gotten to know you better, why I just think you're so amazing because you're passionate about this, right? I know Eric is passionate about this, and I think that's why we get along because this is something that's important to all of us, and we care about it. And you can tell when you talk to somebody that they're passionate about it and they genuinely care about it. And at the end of the day, I'll never meet Antonio Brown, but this is all important. All of it is important, right? And so... Every one of these things is important because in some cases, you know, we're talking about life or death. That's the reality of it. So, Well, the saying goes, you know, you help one person, you help everybody. Mm -hmm. and, and that's just what I think we're lacking right now Yeah, in America. Absolutely. I got nothing else, man. That was a wonderful yeah. conversation. I needed that. I needed yeah. that. <laughs> uh, you know, I feel the same way. I love it. Just like have that camaraderie and have that conversation. So let's keep doing it. Let's keep having these conversations. But thank you guys. Absolutely. Thank you, Eric. Appreciate it, man. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate it. One of my favorite things about our Sports Epreneur content platform is the opportunity to chat with amazing people in and around the world of sports. We hope you enjoyed the conversation. If you want to connect more, hit us up on Instagram at Sports Epreneur. Thank you for listening to this Cad Source production, the Sports Epreneur podcast, the podcast where sports and entrepreneurship collide. Thank you for listening to the Millennium Counseling Center podcast, where hope is yours, it's time to soar. Continue along your journey of healing, hope, and recovery with us next week. If you want to learn more about mental health, recovery, or if you just need someone to talk to, 
send us a message on Instagram or fill out the contact form on our website at millenniumhope.com. We are here to talk.